Hey, 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 what's up, everybody? It is Uncle Matt here for our Friday night live stream. I uh, got uh, some interesting stuff to get into tonight, so uh, I'm not going to waste much time on this one, especially because I actually, you know, I have a hard out on this. I will say we're late to start. I don't know that I've ever actually hit the time that I set when I scheduled these live streams. You know, I think I scheduled this one for 5.30. It's currently 5.47. Oh, I, run, I had a run going that I apparently never stopped. 3.17 miles. Fitness, y'all. Anyway, got a hard out tonight. Jess and I are going to see The Flash. I'm pretty excited for it. I mean, it's weird because like this movie had a lot of hype and then the early reviews are kind of mixed, so we'll see what happens. It's going to be very funny. We're going to make a vlog of it, you know, like we usually do. Uh, but it'll be really funny because Jess uh, did not really want to go see this movie. She was like, I don't really care for Ezra Miller. I don't really care for DC movies. But I was like, Michael Keaton's back. Is Batman, and she's like, well, fine, I guess so. So she's at least intrigued by that. So we're gonna go see it. Her, I think some of our best videos are when she's upset or mad at me. So this will be a great one. So stay tuned for that. That's gonna be our movie Monday this week. Is me and Jessica going to see the Flash? Um, but you know, a lot to come here. We've got a live stream to get into. Big news coming out of a lot of the areas of interest I have, as you see in the description, the thumbnail, the big story in the U.S. soccer bubble that we live in. Greg Berhalter is back. But did he ever really leave? That's kind of the question. So last night, huge, huge matchup. U.S. men's national team taking on Mexico in the semifinals of the prestigious, uh, historic, vaunted Nations League Cup. Funny story with that. I went to tune into Paramount Plus last night, and this is this is this tells you a little bit about maybe how far uh, El Tri, the Mexican national team, has fallen. I went to tune into the match. And this also maybe says that I haven't paid close enough attention to the vaunted, prestigious Nations Cup. I saw the Mexican team walking out of the tunnel first, and I was like, oh, I must be on the wrong feed. Like, this must be the other semifinal, because when was the last time there was a CONCACAF competition where, you know, Mexico and USA were on opposite sides of the bracket as the top two teams that were destined to meet in the finals, you know? So I was like, oh, yeah, we're not playing Mexico in this game. I thought we were playing, like, you know, uh, Panama or Costa Rica or somebody, and Mexico was in the other match. And then I kind of looked, and I was like, I looked at the schedule, and I was like, oh, we are actually playing Mexico in this game. How bad U.S. fan of me to uh, have not been aware that that was actually a Mexico game. I was just like, oh, semifinal of this random CONCACAF tournament they made up. I'm going to tune in and watch. Strong team. And then I was like, oh, this is actually the huge USA-Mexico rivalry match. Um so maybe for a fun game. Obviously, if you watch the game, it was insane. Uh, USA was incredible in the match. Just ran right through Mexico. Um, shockingly, to some degree, 3-0 win. Obviously, kind of marred by the last like, 20 minutes or so where the Mexican players clearly knew that you know they weren't going through. And they started like clearly taking little cheap shots, clearly taking little digs. You know, I don't want to say that they were necessarily trying to draw cards from the U.S. team to try to ruin the final force. But, I mean... Mission accomplished. They drew two. They got two red cards. Both the times they got red cards, somehow we also got a red card. Like there's always been this like shade around the Mexican national team that Concacaf favors them, that doesn't want to give them cards, doesn't want to necessarily punish them. You know they've been allowed to do the homophobic chants at the goalkeepers for years without much punishment. You go around, you see the various videos of like them choking players and not getting any punishment. Which that was the funniest one. They gave Wes McKinney a red card for putting his hands to the face or the throat of a Mexican player. And you can find a hundred pictures of Mexican players choking Weston McKinney throughout the years that got zero cards. So, insanity there. Canada USA on Sunday. Richard Greenberg jumped in the chat. Yeah, it's going to be a huge one. I'm hoping, i got to see what time the match is. I'm going to be traveling Sunday. If you haven't seen my trip announcement video, I'm going down to Florida. I'm going to my usual haunts. Florida, you know, Orlando, Disney World, or Universal. My plan is to leave early enough Sunday to be down there, you know, to enjoy the evening down there. Uh, maybe find, you know, I'd like, is there a local U.S. watch party, American Outlaws of Orlando watch party where I can go watch the match? Um, but that all depends on how my travel goes. Like, if I get down there early enough and can find a place, I'm going to go watch that match. If not, so be it. But like I was saying, last 20 minutes, Mexico just started acting like, you know, they were clearly out to just tear the game up, hurt U.S. players, cause U.S. to be disrupted. You know, they knew they weren't going to win the match. Their fans were throwing beers on the field. There was multiple reports of, like, multiple brawls going on in the stadium that were unchecked by security. It's just, like, 
they get away with this every time. I don't understand how, like, they've just been given free will to do whatever they want in matches. Like, you know, uh, I had a friend that was texting me, like, another soccer fan, and he was like, so he knows how it goes, and he's like, how is this still not being punished? Like, the way their fans behave, the way every match goes that doesn't go their way. It's just that way all the time. Like, any other sport in, you know, maybe not the world, but in America, like, you just, like, compare it to, like, an NBA game. Like, if you went, like, the look at the malice at the palace. Like, one beer got thrown, and it led to, like, one of the biggest controversies in NBA history. There's just beers getting chucked galore. The Mexican players are literally kicking everybody. There's homophobic chants from the fans, and it just, like, CONCACAF does nothing for the most part. So, historically, you know, I don't expect much to come out of this match, but it was a crazy last 20 minutes. Sucks for us to have such a dominant performance to just run through Mexico, just make them look like chumps, and lose two key players because of retaliation for what the Mexican team was doing. Weston McKinney and Sergio Modest, both getting red cards, both out for the final against Canada. That kind of stinks. Uh, we've got decent depth, though. I mean, this isn't like the past U.S. teams where, like, you know, you lose players and, like, it's up the creek without a paddle. I don't really know who goes right back. That's that's a little questionable with uh, Des being out. You know, Joe Scally maybe. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't necessarily, like, mind – the drop off of Luca Vittori coming in, if he's the one coming in for Wes McKinney, he probably doesn't have the full range of passing that Weston has, the kind of more, you know, complete player that Weston is, but he's still a very solid player. He's still like, I, he won me over that one match where he constantly was getting in the face of the players. He was like the bodyguard for Christian Pulisic one match, and that was, that was, he became one of my favorite players in that instant that match. I would expect he comes in because he seems like the next kind of, next man up with Tyler Adams being out injured, but we'll see. It's very disappointing to end that match, but. Obviously, the uh, end of the match, the end of the match was not what you want to see. Not, you know, Mexican fans and players kind of ruining the match, and then our players kind of getting caught up in it and doing things they shouldn't do retaliation wise. And now we got two players out for the final, but still should be a good match another either way. Uh, obviously, the big news though that, that kind of overshadowed the whole thing, the whole thing came out, I believe, midway through or right around the start of the first half. Greg Berhalter is officially back as U.S. Men's National Team head coach. Certainly erupted U.S. Men's National Team's Twitter. Whole contingent of people that have just never liked him, despite, you know, Gold Cup champion, Nations League champion, crazy good track record against Mexico. If you look at, like, the underlying stats, actually we are a much better attacking team than we've ever been at any point in U.S. history. I think uh, they even said on the broadcast last night that he is by win percentage, the most successful U.S. men's national team coach of all time. Uh, but because he didn't do that well when he went to Europe, because he never won a MLS Cup when he was in Columbus, because he's American, this like self-hating thing that some U.S. fans have wants to tear him down. And I get it. He's not a sexy, you know, coach. He's not, you know, I think there's these aspirations that the U.S. thinks we should go get like one of the top coaches in the world. But I mean, like, the top coaches in the world aren't coaching, you know, club level like you look at the most successful club teams in the world Argentina just won the World Cup with a coach granted they have Lionel Messi <laughs> that's like that's a key component there but they won the World Cup with a guy who's never coached any league you know has no league titles you look at recent World Cup champions Jokey jo 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 Lowe you know German's coach he never really did much outside of the you know he, I think he won I was trying to look at it I was trying to look at like what other national team successful coaches have done I think he won like an Austrian Bundesliga but he never you know one the, he was never a Bundesliga coach like his most successful stuff was in Germany there's like a distinction between who's a national team coach and who's a you know league coach that I don't think people give enough credit to everybody's just like oh go get Pep go get Jose Mourinho go get Jesse Marsh whoever it's like there's league coaches and there's national team coaches they're two completely different animals is Greg a good enough world a uh, good enough coach to win a world cup probably not but, I mean, if we're being honest, and, like, I, I don't, I hate lowering the bar. I hate the, like, oh, we shouldn't have any high expectations type thing. But, like, as good as the squad is, as good as this generation of U.S. players are, do we do we really think they're going to be a World Cup winning team? I think we're still in the developmental stage of the U.S. national team where go as far as you can in the World Cup, win the Gold Cup, win the Nations League. We got Copa America coming up in 2026. Let's have a good showing in that, you know. I'm not 100% sure we can't win that, but, I mean, it's Brazil and Argentina, but it's going to be a very different Argentina from the Argentina that just won the World Cup with, you know, maybe Messi maybe not being around for that, although I think 
Argentina will do everything they can to get him to stick around long enough for that tournament. Um, but I think Greg has been successful. I think he's done a good job. I think if the whole controversy with him, the Reynas, and his wife had not come out, he would have got his job renewed. He this none of this had happened. I think it's more the that situation, the gap where he was kind of out and they were maybe looking to replace him is what kind of sours a lot of people on him coming back. It's like, well, we could have changed. We should have changed. But, you know, it's not the same. I, I'm sure there's still some of the same old US, USSF stuff that was kind of, like, messing it all up now. But, like, we got this new guy who just came from Southampton that has, like, no connection at all to the history of the U.S. national team. He's just purely a soccer guy who's built up Southampton. Granted, they just fell apart and got relegated. Maybe not the best time to hire somebody from Southampton, but... For whatever reason, you know, all the good old boys, the buddies who used to be a part of the U.S. national team that were blamed for Greg having the job before, they're all gone. The new regime's in, and they still looked at everything and said, at this point in time, Greg Berhalter is the best coach for the U.S. men's national team. I'm a very big troll with, like, one of my buddies who hates Greg Berhalter. I'm constantly like, what a hire. Great job. Great job. And it's mostly being a troll, but I do think there you have to give some credence to the success he's had. You have to give some... I don't know if that's even the right word I'm trying to use here. You have to, you know, acknowledge how many players have come out and said, we respect Greg, Greg built this culture, Greg taught us, you know, the best way to play, Greg's built this whole thing up. You know, Christian Pulisic, best U.S. player maybe of all time when all is said and done, if he keeps going the way he's going now. Uh, you know, multiple other players have come out and said, you know, we hope Greg comes back. You know, he built this whole thing, you know, he built this thing. And they were talking about it on the broadcast without necessarily giving Greg credit. They were talking about, you know, in those scuffles, in that match, you could tell how much more those guys wanted to win that game than the players going back to that Trinidad and Tobago game, that infamous game where we fell out of and missed our chance to go to the 2018 World Cup. There was guys who were just there to be there. Everybody right now who's playing for the U.S. team is playing for the badge. They're playing for each other. Those guys all loved each other. Walker Zimmerman had a really interesting interview this past week where he talked about, like, he's been a part of teams, not national team, club level, where it's just like, you're going to work, you're doing your job. You go there, you leave, you go back, you're hanging out with your little friends. And he was talking about, like, the U.S. team, they're like, what are we doing after practice, guys? Where are we going? We're going bowling, we're going to get some beers, we're going to the, you know, the bar, we're going to get we're, sushi, what are we doing tonight? Like, they're buddies. They all love each other. And you can tell that when they're, like, joking around, goofing around, uh, Weston and... Christian Pulisic would do rock, paper, scissors after beating, scoring goals against Mexico. I mean, you can just tell the camaraderie. You can tell the passion these players have to play for the national team. And I think you have to give Greg some credit for kind of reinstilling that after it kind of fell out towards the end of the failed Jurgen Klinsmann, Bruce Arena kind of hybrid era that led us to missing the 2018 World Cup. Once again, I did think this probably was a good opportunity to make a change with the situation with the Reynas and, you know, his wife, you know, that came out because I do think there is probably somewhere out there a coach. Like, I don't think we're going to get Pep Guardiola or Jose Green or anything like that. But I think there's a coach that would come coach the national team who probably has a higher level than Greg Ber Berhalter has. But, you know, it is what it is. I'm not mad that he is back. I'm mad that the weird kind of gap six months where it's like, what's going to happen here? And it sucks. And obviously there was some weird stuff that came out, you know, obviously with the domestic abuse stuff that came out that, that kind of probably delayed the inevitable, which was you at the Federation wanting to keep Greg Berhalter, who has been very successful. And I, you know, I watched Charlie Davies and, you know, uh, Maurice Adu very difficultly try to navigate discussing that last night. And so it's not something I want to get into. Um, I'm going to take the Clinton Dempsey route and say, you know, I'm not going to talk about it. That's, you know, their stuff that went behind the scenes. You know, obviously you should never have a situation like that, but it's been investigated. It's been dealt with. Everybody involved has decided it's best to continue on and move forward with Greg Berhalter. I trust the players. I trust the players, you know, especially somebody like Christian Pulisic who keeps coming out and saying, like, this guy has done so much. We trust him. We want to keep going with him. So I'm supportive of the hire. Like I said, I might have taken the opportunity to make a change when you had that opportunity presented to you, but, you know, we don't know what was behind the scenes in terms of, like, I, I say there's probably better candidates out there. I don't personally, off the top of my head, can name those candidates, and there's a good chance the U.S. talked to those candidates. 
it maybe came to the conclusion that it wasn't the right fit or those guys weren't willing to come to the same thing. Who knows? We don't really know what happened behind the scenes, but I mean, I kind of think they probably always wanted to keep Greg all along. I mean, that just makes sense, but, you know, proof's in the pudding. They were talking about, like, on a post-broadcast, well, would you want to give him a two-year contract, you know, to make him sort of reprove it after all the situation, make sure he's regained the trust of the players, you know? If things fall apart, right, when he comes back to coaching, like, if, you know, we have, like, we still have the Copa America in 2026, so, like, we do kind of have one big competition on the horizon between now and 2026, is it 2024? 2024, it's 2026 at the World Cup. So there's still time for Greg to just poop the bed and everybody decide this was a mistake, we can go get somebody, you know, do whatever you want to do. The weird thing about the whole thing was, like, the timing of it where, like, a couple days ago, word was starting to come out that Greg might be taking the Club America job, which just seemed insane. That was the weirdest thing. The whole thing was like, why would Club America hire Greg Berhalter to be their head coach? That was so weird to me, but a day later, that's when it came out. Well, now Club America believes that it's not going to happen because they believe he's back into the pool for the national team coach. A day later, he's a national team coach again. It's all weird. Like I said, I'm not anti-Greg guy. I don't think he's the best coach in the world. I'm not like going to get on a soapbox and be like, this is why Greg's, you know, the XG and the underlying stats tell you that Greg's the best possible coach we could get. I'm just going to say, I don't think he's as bad as, like, some people in U.S. men's national team Twitter and fandom think. I'm fine with him coming back. If the players are fine with it, that's the most important thing to me. Obviously, there's the weird situation with Gio. Maybe with Pepe, too, where Pepe got left out of the World Cup. That's got to be addressed a little bit. But, I mean, those things are a part of soccer. Every team has to deal with those situations. The only reason the Gio situation blew up is because... His family. He had the ultimate, like, freaking helicopter parent situation that just completely blew up. And I'm so shocked by that. To that, I'm still shocked by it to this day because you would think somebody who's been through every phase of the soccer pyramid in the U.S. that Claudia Rainey has been through would not be that type of person, you know? Especially, like, and I don't know if, like, it's just, like, helicopter parents are going to be helicopter parents. I don't know if it was because he thought he was friends with Greg, that Greg would give his son special treatment. I... I that is just still baffling to me to say. That was the most shocking thing in the whole thing, that it was Claudio Reina, of all people. Like, it's not just some random wealthy dad who paid for their son to go through academies and the DA and basically paid their way into the U.S. national team. It was Claudio Reina, who should kind of be aware more than anybody else how these type of things are supposed to work. It's such a weird situation, and it tarnished the whole thing. And But I do have to think, you know, there had to be some type of discussion about how that was going to work moving forward between Greg and Gio's relationship before the decision was made to bring Greg back. I hope so, at least, because, I mean, weird kind of correlation. CM Punk is about to return to AEW, and from all accounts, the issues that led to his, outside of his injury, the issues that led to his uh, absence from AEW, he even said in the ESPN article today, have not been resolved. So... I kind of think if you're going to bring somebody back that was part of like a kind of conflict or kind of issue within your organization, maybe resolve, resolve the conflict before, you know, bringing them back. But that's just me. I Obviously, I'm sitting in my dumb little man cave talking about this. I'm not a high-level executive in any of these places making these type of decisions. All right, Orlando City, playing at home when you're down there. I don't know. I was thinking about that uh, today because one of the things that's kind of unique about this trip is I don't have a hard out on the trip. I'm driving down, so... I have to be back by, like, whatever day I'm supposed to go back to work. That's kind of my heart out. But, like, I could stay an extra day if I want to, two days. So, like, I don't know if they'll be – like, I won't be down. I assume, you know, because MLS is almost all Saturday games now. Um, I'll look at the schedule, though. If they maybe have, like, a midweek Wednesday night game or maybe if they have a Saturday night game against an interesting opponent next week, maybe I stay an extra day for that. I don't know. It's something I've definitely thought about. Just, I've been to an Orlando City game before. That was before I started doing videos. Like, I went there, you know, kind of like their stadium. It's pretty nice. It's a little tighter than uh, National SCs and the concourses and stuff like that. But it's a decent stadium, decent atmosphere. Kind of weird <laughs> where it's set up. It, it's funny. I've been there before. It's an interesting place. I did think about maybe going down. I'll look at the schedule and decide if that's something I can make happen while I'm down there. I said at the start of this, I'm watching the new Flash movie tonight. As soon as I in this live stream, I'm heading out. It's now 6.06. I'm probably got to be out of here by like 6.30. Going to the movies. We're going to see the Flash movie. There will be a video review coming for that Monday. Greg Berhalter, only problem is he's not a sexy choice. He's a solid manager for the U.S. I agree. I think, you know, there's fans who 
you know, maybe they weren't necessarily national team fans first. They were, you know, somebody who got into soccer through FIFA and were like, oh, I love Manchester City. Oh, we got to get the best coach in the world. And just like national teams don't work the same way club teams work. You know, you don't always get like a huge, you know, sexy, successful manager. Like I said, like Didier Jets, it, it, but it's, I think that's also a part of so soccer culture. Like Didier Jets champs, <laughs> France fans kind of hate him. And he won them a World Cup, and they kind of hate him. So it, that's just kind of tells you, you know, you, Jogi Lowe for Germany, you know, he's not like some, like, had no real track record of huge success at, like, the domestic level, club level before, you know, getting Germany another World Cup. So it's it's weird. I think people just, like, kind of don't fully understand that national team and clubs kind of work differently. Like, that's one of my – one of the arguments you always see against Greg is, like, we well, could even win the MLS Cup when he's an MLS coach. Not many people win the MLS Cup. I mean, there's like, it's not like it's it's a weird tournament that's really hard to win. Like, shockingly, like it's. I I was gonna say something stupid. I was gonna say it's maybe harder to win than some of the European tournaments, but I don't think that's actually true. But like, it is kind of weird, you know, because in England, if you're the top team, top four teams are always gonna win that cup outside of that weird Leicester year. MLS, you know, there's two or three teams that are head and shoulders above the rest, but I mean, because of the playoffs, because of the weird nature of how playoffs and knockout games can work, literally anybody can win MLS Cup. Greg, or, or here in Nashville City, uh, I say Greg, I'm stuck on Greg. Gary Smith won an MLS Cup with a terrible, you know, for all intents and purposes, Colorado Rapids team, just because he set things up well, he outcoached teams, he bunkered down the hatches as he's known to do, and just fought their way through that playoffs that season and won an MLS Cup. So, I don't really, like, think MLS Cup, winning the MLS Cup or not, you know, is a huge achievement. I mean, Jurgen Klinsmann, like, some people are still butthurt that we got rid of Jurgen Klinsmann. Like, what what did he really do? You know, he had one good cup uh, tournament run outside of it in Germany. But, I mean, how hard is that to do? Look at the talent Germany has. What has he done since he left the U.S.? Nothing. What did he do between Germany and the U.S.? Nothing. So, I mean, it's like, you, you got to understand, national team, club teams, those type of coaches, it's a different mindset, it's a different thing. Because, like, you know, if you're a national team manager, you get the players, what, once every month and a half at the most for, like, a week, half a week at the most. It's not like you're constantly developing players, constantly training players. It takes a different type of coach who can, like, look at their pool, figure out who fits together, who can put the pieces together well, get them together quickly put in a system quickly and just have it go. And I think Greg's done a good job of that. You know, is Greg going to win a World Cup? No. But is there any coach that would come into this situation and win a World Cup with the U.S.? Probably not. I would almost say definitely no. I, I hate to be like a pessimist because I want to hope for my team, obviously. But, I mean, it's just being real. The odds of the U.S. winning a World Cup, in, even with this great kind of roster, this great generation we have, are still kind of slim, and I don't know that there's any coach out there who's would be able to do it, you know. So, enough talking about the U.S. national team. It was a fun game. It was, you know, good win, big match coming up against Canada. Hopefully, I'll be able to get down to Florida in time to find a place to watch that, but we'll see how that turns out. On to the next local match. I will shout out Richard because he's been in the chat a little bit. Toronto FC, at this point in time, I think we can officially say our national FC, one of the kryptonite teams for us. It doesn't matter how good we're doing, how good how good Toronto's doing, how bad we're doing, how bad Toronto's doing. That's almost always going to be like a weird match where the result's just unpredictable. You know, uh, Toronto looked incredible the first half in that game. The second half, National C finally turned it on. It could have been 2-0, 3-0 TFC at halftime, honestly. Um, but they're just one of those teams. And there's two, I think Toronto, for, Toronto's the one that makes no sense to me. I don't know if it's just because it's always like a weird long trip or if just Bradley is just one of those coaches who just kind of knows how to kind of get results when he needs to but Toronto Philadelphia and Red Bull are like the three kryptonite teams from Nashville SC and one of the things that's troubling about our match this weekend St. Louis F St. Louis City comes to Nashville first time these two teams are match matching up obviously the expansion team for St. Louis and in a lot of the previews a lot of the podcasts I listened to this weekend talking about the matchup the comparison that keeps coming up is like that St. Louis's style of play is like a hybrid Red Bull, hybrid Philadelphia. So it's like, oh, great. The two teams Nashville SC probably struggles against more than any other. Here comes a team that is like a hybrid of their two systems. Hooray. Uh, 
obviously they've had an incredible start to the season. They're number one in the West as an expansion team that everybody kind of picked to be dead last. I think including me, but I'm not that much informed of a person, so I can't be blamed for picking them last the same way that like high level MLS pundits were. So don't blame me. Don't blame me for picking them last. I was just like listening to other people and going like, hey, they also said they're last. They're probably gonna be last. Uh, they have come down to earth a little bit more. They've definitely been better at home than they have been on the road. Um, so it's an interesting matchup. They like, like I said, their style of play scares me, and the fact that they play a style that has been Nashville SC's kryptonite against other teams. Uh, the interesting thing to me is what does Nashville SC do lineup wise? Because we're missing Anibal Godoy, Fafa Paco, and Walker Zimmerman due to international duty. So three guys, key players: um, Lucas McNaughton, who <laughs> in the hilarious like. Uh, social media video that was put out by the team on Twitter. I can't remember who exactly it was. I think it was maybe Dan Lovitz or Taylor Washington called uh, Lucas McNaughton the king in the north. And I was like, that is hilarious. That's genius. I'm going to like just stick with that forever now. He came out injured against Toronto. Bummer for him because, you know, it was like kind of a homecoming match for him. Listed as questionable, which, you know, if Gary Smith listed anybody as questionable, that means they're out for six months. So I would expect him to play. So do we go – Straight swap, just keep the lineup we've been running, the formation we've been running, just plug Josh Bauer in. Uh, do we feel the need to shift to maybe a back five, tuck Dan Lovitz inside, bring Taylor Washington in as a left wing back? It, it's going to be an interesting match to see how Gary adjusts to the missing players tactically. And is Leal finally ready to come back in the starting lineup? Did he get that confidence boost uh, from the goal? Although that was a complete fluke goal. Sean Johnston, like, what are you doing, guy? How do you let that one go in? Um, but that has to be a constant confidence boost for Leal. You know, his range of shooting would be a huge upgrade for Nashville SC. You know, I've heard a lot of people that cover the team that know kind of the ins and outs, how they do things, say, you know, it's not that the reason Leal hasn't started yet isn't necessarily because of, like, you know, Wheel or somebody else was in good form. It's because Gary was still not confident that Leal was fully starting level fit. So that's kind of the question. Is he starting level fit? Because they pretty much everybody I've listened to who covers the team closely says, as soon as Leal is fit enough to start, he's going to start again. Is it tomorrow? We certainly could use it. We certainly could use the boost of him being in the team full-time. Because him and Hanny together, like, that's a completely different dynamic for a team, especially with Fafa being out. Because Fafa's kind of been our, you know, Schaffelberg too, but Fafa's kind of been our biggest secondary goal-scoring threat outside of Hanny. So with him being out now for international duty, if we can get Leal back into the starting lineup, have that extra kind of, Scoring threat, and the scoring threat he brings is so different, like, you know, because he's got the long-range shooting that we don't really have from anybody else. That could be a huge, huge, huge boost for us. I think with the National SC defense, the weakness there being opened up a little bit with the injuries and Zimmerman on international duty, I could definitely see there being a lot of goals. Not, maybe not a lot of goals in this game, but there's going to be goals in this game, and it may come down to which keeper can make the more spectacular saves because – you know, St. Louis, crazy, has a designated player as one of, as one of their designated players as their keeper, uh, former Dortmund keeper, Berkel, Berkel, I'm sure it's like a weird German pronunciation I can't get. And obviously Joe Willis has been, you know, at borderline his best form for Nashville SC this season. So I think both teams are going to have chances. So it could come down to which keeper stands on their head the most. If I was going to give a prediction, I would go. Three, two, Nashville SC. I think the key to the match is we cannot afford to do what like 10 teams have done this season and do just an insane, out of nowhere, bizarre back pass from one of our center backs directly to a St. Louis FC four. Haven't they scored like eight goals off those this season? They're like that's what some people like have said. Like that like it it's crazy how good they've been out of the gates. But I've seen a lot of comparisons to Austin last year, where Austin was really good last year, but if you kind of looked at the data, which I'm not a big data guy, this is me repeating things that I've heard other people say, the underlying stats, I don't look at the underlying stats, I just repeat what other people have said about the underlying stats. It's more fluky, it's more luck, it's more not that sustainable. This is actually a really strong, really good team. But I mean, when you get the luck, you gotta take advantage of it. They put them themselves in a really good position to be really strong. Uh, their top striker has been out for a few games, and they've mostly kind of held the ship together. Um, so it should be a good match. Like I said, with both teams, you know, their team's not necessarily known for their defense, and our defense is kind of uh, 
potentially piecemeal with Zimmerman and maybe Naughton both being out. So 3-2 Nashville SC would be my score prediction for the match tomorrow night. I'll be there live. I'm going to make a vlog for it, so you'll see a vlog from the game. Get the full reaction to whatever actually does happen in that match. Should be a fun one, but uh, outside of that, lots of good stuff coming up. we got the whole no telling how many videos I'll get out of being down in Florida. I tend to be able to get a lot of videos out of trips because, you know, I'll, sometimes I'll focus on one thing and make a video of it. Sometimes I'll split a day in two if we have, like, a lot going on in one day. But a lot coming up with that. A lot coming up, like I said earlier, going to The Flash tonight. So there'll be a review of that movie coming up. Always appreciate watching. Always appreciate the engagement from people who jumped in the chats like Richard has tonight. Um, but we're going to wrap it up because i got to finish getting ready. Me and Jess are going to see The Flash. Like I said, uh, hope you all have a great night, a great weekend. Enjoy your time. Uh, we'll see you on the next one. I appreciate everybody watching. Have a great night.